Um, thank you very much for uh, giving us the opportunity to tell you about the technology sector. Um, we'll touch on polar and how we tackle the sector if we can, uh, but there's an awful lot to get through. Um, I, I uh, pride myself at being able to speak fast and pour through presentations. 51 slides in 20 minutes is tough. Um, so I'm, I'll try my best. I'll try and be selective as well. Uh, it's, it's been a, f a fantastic run in technology. We're really excited about the space. I've been a specialist investor in the sector for 20 years. Um, and, you know, the pace of innovation uh, shows no signs of uh, abating. Uh, lots of disruption happening across the panoply of uh, sectors. We'll talk about some of them as we go through the, pr the presentation. Okay, so very quickly, um, for those that don't know Polar Capital, uh, we're a boutique manager, uh, one of our largest, right now the largest leg uh, of, of uh, what we do is, um, is the technology sector or the tech, the tech franchise that was um, really the founding leg of Polar Capital. I've uh, been at the firm since 2003. Uh, and my kind of co, my partner, uh, Nick Evans, and I have been working together since 2007. We're big fish in a small pond. Uh, we run three and a half billion dollars, which is a, a good size of, uh, of assets to run. Uh, not too big, not too small, just about right. Um, and a nice sized team, probably the largest tech team in Europe. Um, and we hold our own against the US peers. Um, so that's, that's us. Um, and the way that we tackle the world is a kind of combination of top down and bottom up. Uh, we try to identify key themes. Um, and those themes can be real world or technology themes. Look for companies that are pure plays on those themes. Avoid companies that are blue sky. We don't do blue sky. We don't do private companies. Uh, we don't have a, a very positive view on incumbent technology companies either. Uh, I think um, as, as people, we tend to over-index the present. And I think in, uh, in financial markets, uh, certainly in technology, people tend to over-index the prospects of, of, of winners uh, continuing to win. Uh, we can come back to that. So we tend to avoid uh, last generation winners. Focus on growth. Uh, we're very much growth centric investors. I, when I walk into a, st a shop, I, I, I don't look at my, in my pocket and say I have 14 pounds and 37 pence. Let's see what we can buy with that. Um, we, 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 likewise, we don't do that as investors. We try to identify what we want to own and then we work out if we can afford the price. Uh, and sometimes we won't buy stocks and sometimes we will. Uh, but ultimately the process is about trying to identify the key winners and then work out if we can, if we can stomach the ticket price. Uh, build a portfolio with, with respect to a benchmark. The benchmark has been terrific. Uh, think about Apple, Google, Facebook. These companies are big in our benchmarks. They've been fantastic winners, uh, primary beneficiaries of the smartphone internet era. Um, so again, no crime in being aware of where your benchmark is if it's a good one. Uh, and then sell the splints. Um, <clears throat> one of my favorite investment stories is about my late father, um, who, who never you know, refused to... Um, you know, admit that when he had bought stocks that had gone down, um, it didn't matter because until he had sold them, he hadn't made a loss. Um, I'm sure we, we all know what that feels like. Um, the, the best example of this was when he bought into a, a business, a, a UK company called British Dredging. Um, it went down a lot. He then discovered that it wasn't British and it didn't do dredging. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, we, we try to do better than my late father. We, we, we do have cell disciplines. The tech sector is uh, brutal. No mean reversion here. Uh, if you were Yahoo and you looked at Google, you, you know, maybe you thought that you were in the game, but you weren't. Um, and, and our experience is very rarely we see mean reversion. So we take, we take, our, we take our, our punishment, if you like. We sell our losers and we try to, our best to run winners. The tech sector, this is a very busy slide. The tech sector requires a slightly different investment process, we think. Uh, primarily because, um, because often technologies are overhyped in the short term and then are followed by explosive periods of growth sometime later. Now, if you get the timing wrong, you can get wiped out, as, as many of us experienced in the late 90s with the internet. Uh, lots of promise, lots of hype, uh, lots of value creation, and ultimately disappointment. And then, boom, 20 years later, the entire world that we live in has been transformed by the internet. So what we try to do is play to our strengths, identify the, the kind of key themes uh, on the left-hand side, but be aware of where they sit on this so-called hype cycle. Leave the investing in that, that, at that time to uh, people pre-market, venture capital, what have you. Um, and then also at the end of the life cycle of technology companies, um, really it's very difficult because prices continue to fall, but everybody has one of those things. Flat panel televisions, PCs, what have you, smartphones right now. Um, and, and unless you're Apple, uh, it's very hard to do anything other than pass down lower prices. And so what happens is the value of the incumbent becomes diminished, and many of these companies look cheap but aren't. Um, and we've, we really have um, avoided some of the worst uh, sort of casualties within tech by understanding this framework. So we don't do the early stage stuff on the gray, we try to avoid the red value trap on the right. And in the middle are a whole bunch of companies that we think have the potential to kind of change the world. Their growth is accelerating. Um, the challenge is that when you try to evaluate these businesses on a forward PE, 
uh, it's very difficult. Amazon has probably never traded on an attractive forward PE. If you were still wedded to that approach to value Amazon, you would have missed out on one of the best investment stories in the last decade. And so again, this does, it's not, I apologize if I sound profligate, it's just that Amazon doesn't care about its forward earnings number. It cares about disrupting a retail across, a, again, a, a broad range of products and now in video and in, in public cloud computing and so on. And so when companies invest for growth against very large market opportunities, they, you need a different toolkit. And again, if that, apologies if that sounds like we're in the 90s, we're not. I uh, very strongly believe that we're not. Um, but you do need to look at things like EV sales. You need to look at um, uh, valuations against operating cash flow. And, and the earnings number is, you know, Jeff Bezos famously says, you know, earnings are what you do when you've run out of growth. Um, I, I'm not sure that I would subscribe to that view entirely. Um, we, we're kind of happy to have a bit of you know, earnings and growth, please. Um, but, but the point is, is that this is a very difficult sector. This, that part of the life cycle is hard for investors to rifle shoot in. So we think you need to, if you like the tech story, you need to look at uh, um, so, someone like us um, that, that will invest in a, a, a diversified portfolio. PCT is 120 stocks. Um, you know, lots of Amazon, lots of Facebook, and lots of Google, but also a lot of companies that hopefully you've never heard of. And hopefully you will. Um, this is the, uh, the, this is the uh, NAV, uh, the NAV of um, the Investment Trust. The, the reason I show it isn't to, uh, to, to show off how well tech has done, although it has done well, is to point out that when we got to 2000 and there was a whole hype cycle there in the bubble and so on, the sector traded on 70 times forward earnings and those earnings, frankly, never materialized. If you go back to the famous transaction of the late 90s of AOL Time Warner, um, I think AOL ended up taking a $100 billion write down, which sort of tells you all you need to know about the 90s. Here we are today, and lots of stocks have gone very, you know, gone, done very well. Facebook's and Google's, and everybody's very nervous about them. And every day I have to listen to people telling about regulatory scrutiny, and it's inevitable that they're going to get broken up, and blah, blah, blah. And, I, you know, again, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe by the time I finish my pitch in 14 minutes, they'll have been broken up. I, I doubt it. Um, what actually has happened is companies like Facebook and Google have got to vast scale and are generating billions, tens of billions of dollars. So, so Google would, will hopefully generate $100 billion of revenues next year. And Facebook will do 50 billion. And so just to compare and contrast to AOL, that company that dominated the internet, I put that in quotes, uh, dominated the internet with its 20 million dial-up subscribers in 1999. Uh, for those uh, too, too young to know what I'm talking about, that's when you tried to download something for two days and then your mother picked up the phone and it took down the internet. Um, <laughs> so, so the world has moved on since AOL, we're, we're, we're very grateful to say. And, and you know, Amazon now just bought Whole Foods, so from a distance it sounds a little bit like uh, the 90s again. But just to put it into contrast, you know, to compare and contrast, uh, AOL, I think, in the 90s had about $4.5 billion of revenues on a 20 million user base. Um, and, and Amazon just put a quarter in of about 40 billion revenues. A quarter. Um, their, their public cloud computing business with a 25% margin is, is, is roughly the same size, in, in one quarter is roughly the same size as AOL in one year at the very peak of its existence. This is a very different internet. This is a smartphone internet where people spend you know, five hours a day, believe it or not, on their smartphones, where, where our behavior has been changed by the internet, our expectations and behavior has been changed. Um, but in the 90s, the PC, PC market dominated the internet. It was 130 million PCs were sold in 2000. Apple will sell 250 million iPhones over the next four quarters, hopefully. Um, just to give you an idea, and that's just Apple alone. The scale of the internet is very different to where it was in the 90s. So it, if it feels like the 90s, it's because this is what the 90s was supposed to look like. It just took 20 years later, 20, 20 years longer. The valuations very quickly. Um, you can see the 90s here. You won't be able to read this in detail, but uh, the absolute valuations, the relative valuations, our portfolio trades a bit more expensive than the market because we've got some more interesting assets, we believe. Um, but the point is it doesn't look anything like the 90s. Um, likewise, here are some valuations, select next generation valuations. There's been a, some movement in software stocks, but actually internet stocks trade pretty reasonably. Um, you know, Google, for all of the, 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 the success of that company, it doesn't trade very dissimilar to the S&P multiple once you back out the cash. And so there's been a, a great reluctance really to chase these winners. The peg ratios of these stocks are below one, which is very different to, how, again, how we were in the 90s. And there, on this right-hand slide here, just says that the kind of the gap between next generation winners, cloud software companies, and incumbent uh, software companies is quite modest, which suggests that the valuation the uplift that we've seen recently is more to do with the market than anything else. And clearly, valuations, I'm sure you've heard from previous speakers, have moved higher. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're eight years, or depending on when your start point was, eight years into a bull market. You know, so if you turn up at a party after it's been roaring for four hours, you know, don't expect to find any good booze left. Um, it's a little bit like that in long bull markets. Valuations rise. 
Uh, the question is trying to pick your poison, um, if you've ever turned up at a party late, you'll know what I mean. Um, M&A, very supportive. Uh, we had uh, nine takeouts, which is a lot for us um, in the Investment Trust on the last fiscal year. The point about this slide is that the M&A tells you that tech is interesting. Uh, it tells you that a lot of incumbents don't have what they need for the next cycle. This is all about the cloud, it's about mobility. But for an IBM, a Cisco, an Oracle, those companies, their, their success has been based on the enterprise and on client, uh, on PC server uh, architectures that are giving way to something much more interesting, the cloud, uh, we'll come back to. And those companies come in and buy our stocks, hopefully, at very large premiums. But the, but the, but the, the fact that they need those assets is, a, is almost like a put option underneath your valuations. When, when we had a sell-off um, post Donald Trump and also in early 2016, we saw a very big pickup in M&A because these companies have shopping lists and they know what they need in order to sort of survive the next cycle. Um, a few slides on disruption, um, just a kind of food for thought, really. Uh, and I think a good a, a reminder of why the tech sector seems to be very well positioned for this. Well, obviously, the disruption is emanating from my sector, uh, largely. So a few things. I'm going to skip that one. Uh, this is the price uh, of computing and bandwidth and storage. And if you went back to the late 90s, you can see why the internet couldn't have delivered on the promise. Bandwidth that cost $500, but um, now cost, you know, a few years ago, now cost two cents. So as technology gets cheaper and cheaper, so it becomes more pervasive. I think that's fairly obvious. I'll talk to you about um, artificial intelligence if I have time. But one of the key drivers for AI is the cost of compute, the cost of storage. And so you can store billions of images at Google, and then you can start force-feeding computers that data uh, and teach them things. I mean, they're not intelligent, but they start to recognize patterns. Um, and we can talk more about that as we go through. This is a critical component to the tech story. Um, number of smartphones, um, you know, two and a half billion, 2.8 billion, whatever the install base is, it's a big number. Uh, it's nearly half of the world's population have access to the internet. It's ubiquitous. The, a network that in the 90s was something you did at work and at home is something you now touch all the time. So I got an Uber here from the office. I was a bit lazy. Um, but Uber is an example of an app which has changed my behavior. I'm sure everybody has uh, apps that have done that. Try, imagine trying to live without Google, for example. Um, would be tricky. Um, big data, this is the idea that there's more data being created every you know, two years than there was in the history of the world before, blah, blah, blah. The most important bit on this picture, uh, this slide is a man up a ladder uh, in the British Library looking for answers. Uh, we don't do that anymore. I mean, some people do. It's pretty dangerous. Um, there's <laughs> probably a health and safety aspect to that. That would never happen now. Um, but what is interesting is that we are, uh, we are digitizing our cumulative knowledge as a species. And we're asking a lot of questions of it. And it is genuinely fascinating. So this is the number of Google searches as a proxy for our interest in asking questions. And what you, you can see is it's gone bonkers. This is a hard un number to understand, two trillion searches. It's obviously higher now. They haven't given us a number since 2016. Um, the point is that when you ask more questions you get, and you get lots of answers, you tend to ask more questions. It's, any parent knows that um, when you actually answer your children. Um, and, and so I took the liberty of, of correlating this very badly with uh, the number of books and manuscripts produced in the medieval period in Europe. Why? Because to me, the internet is like the printing press. Um, you, you, and we are living at the time of the internet. And therefore, it's very hard for us to understand how far this can go. And I read about people trying to call an end to it and these platforms and they can't keep getting bigger and blah, blah, blah. But people at the time of the printing press couldn't have known about the end of, of the divine right of kings or the, the schism of Christianity. You couldn't have known that. And so I feel like we're in that sort of period now where um, we really are beginning just scratching the surface of much, much longer term widespread disruption. And the fact that 15% of the questions asked of Google have never been asked before gives me goose pimples. Um, I probably don't get out enough, but I think it's pretty interesting. Um, <laughs> More disruption. So here's a good slide. This says that the internet and the scale of some of these platforms is fairly, frankly unprecedented. So two billion people go to Facebook. And when you read the press, you would never find a good thing about Facebook, would you? It's always bad. It's always fake news. It's the, the Russians bought the presidency for £8.53 um, using Facebook. And maybe they did. Um, in fact, if they did, it would be a good reminder of how powerful the platform is. Um, I mean, don't, you know, probably don't want to repeat that outside of this room. Um, any business that looks like the thing on the left, uh, where there's an expert at the center, is at risk. And so that's a mini cab office with all the cabs coming back to the middle and then going back out again. One of the reasons why the Uber story works is that cab drivers spent 50% of their money of fuel going back to the office uh, to have some turgid conversation with someone there, almost certainly. Now we don't bother with that. We just have Uber where we, can, we don't have to have a base station. We, we, we have a network, a distributed network. This is um, the model for most things, I think, going forwards. Um, and companies like Google and Facebook are in pole position. Uh, this is the cost of artificial intelligence. Um, hugely excited about this. Uh, there's been a millionth, a millionth fold in 
improvement in, the parallel, in parallel hardware that's used for AI just in the last eight years. But this is dramatic. Uh, and some of the stuff that Google is doing is quite mind-boggling in terms of um, image recognition, live translation. You can now buy earbuds from Google that with a five-second delay will translate um, a, a foreign language into your ear so you can understand. Now, five seconds is too long, uh, but one or two seconds is mind-boggling. And so really exciting stuff. Again, more examples of why the sector is, is disrupting other sectors. Um, this is a good one. 26% uh, of people that click on a Facebook ad buy the, buy the product. I mean, that's pretty special. No one will talk about that when they talk about Facebook and the fake news situation, but this is how people are spending money. This is why money is going to Facebook and why $50 billion, as I said uh, last year, um, is, is, that's what the company should generate. And this year we'll see the internet overtake TV uh, in terms of its global uh, share of advertising dollars. Um, retail, I think everyone knows the success of Amazon, the, uh, the, the, the state of play in the, the high street, not good. We can skip that. This is interesting. Um, right now, Amazon... Uh, has 30% market share of all batteries bought online. And this is just to challenge the idea that brands that are strong today may not persist tomorrow. Lots of people have money invested in companies that are supposedly castles, bond proxies. And we are just challenging that, that idea. And as the number of voice recognition systems in people's houses, like Amazon Alexa, does what it does on the left-hand side, um, your, your behavior changes. You know, Alexa, add me some batteries to my... My, my shopping cart. I don't care who the brand of the batteries are, they're generic. Um, and the same applies to things like baby wipes. So just something to keep an eye on. I think the whole world moves to this model. You're either in the kind of mass personalized luxury, not luxury, but, but uh, uh, I suppose the quality end of life. You're John Lewis, let's say, your Starbucks, where you, you, you monetize a, a unit of time in a very interesting space with Wi-Fi, buy a cup of coffee, or you're in the business of selling coffee for a pound and a polystyrene cup. Uh, anything in the middle looks like it's being hugely disrupted, hollowed out. Um, and that's the, the function of hyper-personalization. Um, content is not king. I think we've all learned that now. Uh, Netflix is really the only network which is growing minutes of, of viewing time. And if you are a Netflix customer, you'll know that much of what you watch is Netflix content. Um, the winners in this are actors and studios, like football players are um, in, in, in the world of soccer. And so again, content is not king. Distribution is much more interesting uh, than content. Okay, um, quickly, I've got three minutes, which is imp an impossibility. Um, eight core themes in our portfolio. Um, there, there are four of them. There are the other four. Um, <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it's, been, it's been great being here. Thanks so much. No, um, I, I, I will use the last. I will use them, I promise. Uh, E-commerce, um, amazing. So here we are, 17 years after the, the bursting of the bubble, and we're still only at 9% of total retail sales. Um, lots more damage to be done, I'm afraid. Uh, to traditional retail. Um, and the way you do that is by reducing friction, delivery times, payments become invisible. You know, again, I had a funny story the other day. I take Uber a lot. Um, and I was going off to do a, a meeting with a client in Canary Wharf. And, and it was slightly precarious where I had to be dropped off. Uh, and so the guy said, I'll drop you off here. And I said, great, great. And uh, opened the door. I jumped out. And, and then he said, you, you owe me 32 pounds. And I said, oh my God, I'm not in an Uber. Um, and and the, po the point about an Uber is that payment has been uh, made invisible. And, and that, I think, is the model going forward. It's Amazon, again, no friction. Click a button, product arrives the next day at your office, um, and, and so on and so forth. So here are some of the names we hold. Uh, it's a very powerful long-term story. Uh, and in China, a company like Alibaba has been uh, growing like a weed. I'm sure you've read lots about Alibaba. Um, advertising, I think we've done already, uh, all about smartphones uh, and, and very high uh, returns. The market is dominated by Facebook and Google outside of China. They, they generate roughly, or they capture roughly, three quarters of all incremental growth which I think is the source of the regulatory scrutiny concerns, which how long can that persist for? Um, but, but I think that uh, that's where the ROIs are. Um, software as a service, I'm going to skip. It's a good story, but it's been a good story and will stay a good story. Gaming is interesting. This is the only content type, I think, that wins because of the internet. So we own all these stocks. They've been terrific. Um, and the, real, the thing that brings them together is that the, the value of these franchises has gone up with the internet because kids can now... Um, download or adults can download extra levels, extra weapons, whatever it might be, those, those digital goods have 99% margins. Um, and ultimately, it, the internet is allowing these, these companies to um, take an awful lot more of people's leisure time and therefore monetize that time. And just to give you an idea of that, you know, there are 55 million people in China that play the same game every day. Uh, it's pretty special. Um, and and you know, I think the Chinese government call it a poison. Um, which gives you an idea of how they feel about it. Um, but that's because people spend nearly two hours a day on that game. Um, Overwatch is a game I play occasionally, uh, and that game uh, has 30 million people that play every month. Um, cyber, I think everyone knows. The cloud is driving everything. 20% uh, of world, the world's compute is done in the cloud. 
uh, and we're heading towards 80, which is going to cause a lot more pressure on incumbents. And then there's robotics. Again, I haven't got time to talk about it, but we're going to radically change the way that we manufacture, warehouse, and do a whole bunch of other things enabled by uh, sensors, um, the Internet of Things, um, and just how, you know, when you think about uh, real-time optimization of businesses, the supply side is not, not built for that. Um, and, and again, if you follow H&M and Intertex, you'll know that there's an awful lot of change occurring in things like fast retail. Um, time's up, but I'm going to ignore you for one minute. Um, uh, just to show you a couple of emerging themes, uh, this is the hype cycle. And so at the top of this is the uh, kind of things like machine learning and autonomous vehicles. We're excited about the auto uh, uh, story. We'll come to it in a second. But we think genuine autonomous vehicles are still five to ten years away, at least in the mainstream sense. I read today that Google is about to um, roll out autonomous taxis in Phoenix. So um, clearly they haven't seen my pitch book. Um, but uh, we think mainstream adoption of AV is still some way away. Here are some of the ones I would quickly focus on. Uh, voice as an interface. Um, we already spend as much time as I think we can on smartphones. And so the next battleground is about voice. Um, it's why you can pick up a device like this for less than probably it costs to make. Um, it's all about changing your behavior, your expectations. And we can talk a lot faster than we can type. And in the last three years, there's been more, um, there's been more uh, progress made in voice recognition than in the, pre the first 30 years of the industry. You've probably heard about, uh, well, let's see if we've got it here. Um, no, we don't. Well, I'll come back to it in a second on AI. Quickly on electric vehicles, we think it's finally happening, thanks to Elon Musk driving down the cost of, uh, um, of battery per, you know, and, and the, the cost and range of electric vehicles, but also the diesel debacle is, is really forcing the hand of auto OEMs to embrace electric uh, hybrid, and over time, uh, autonomous. And for us, this is fascinating because we're going to see our companies um, put a lot more content into cars going forwards. Hundreds of dollars of semiconductor content becomes thousands of dollars um, in these new vehicles. I think we can skip that one. Esports, this is a real picture of people watching other people play computer games. Um, if, you, if you didn't feel old before, you will now. Um, oh, it makes me feel old. Um, but uh, 150 million people watch other people play computer games. Um, I, I read, actually, the Olympic movement is considering including esports going forwards. Um, okay. Uh, artificial intelligence, very quickly. Um, this is, you know, the next big thing. We've just launched a fund, actually, at, at Polar, to play into this a bit more purely. Um, but the cost down, the data sets, and again, we're not talking about AI like HAL, um, which was this kind of nasty, you know, don't climb out of a spaceship and expect to get back in in a hurry um, guy. Um, but the artificial intelligence that people like Google are doing is pretty spectacular. I, I saw a pitch from uh, Google last week at an IT conference, um, and what they've managed to do with neural networks, uh, general purpose coding, um, they can solve for things that don't even know what they're being solved for. And if you've read about AlphaGo, um, which is their, um, their AI that beat the best players of Go around the world, they've just created a new one called AlphaGo Zero, which makes the old AlphaGo look like it didn't know what it was doing. Um, very exciting stuff. We haven't got time to talk about it. I think with that, I should probably stop. So thank you all very much for your time. Thank you.